My name is Angela Dresselhaus and welcome to our Hope for HS uh, webinar. And uh, today we have Dr. Holoham with us and she is going to be talking to us about watching out for comorbidities. And this is one of the final events that we're doing for this year's Awareness Week. We hope that you've had a great week and you've had a lot of learning opportunities. So I'd like to just go on and pass it on over. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Hi, I'm Heather Hollihan. I'm one of the dermatologists at UNC in Chapel Hill. Um, and I am thrilled to give you this talk today. My hope is that the talk um, will provide some confidence and advocacy and just um, expand your knowledge when it comes to HS and other conditions that um, might appear as well. So um, that's what we're gonna, I'm gonna talk to you about today. Um, and then at the end, we'll have plenty of time for questions. So thank you. So I'm gonna start by sharing my screen with y'all. Okay, can you all see my screen? It looks good. Okay, thanks. Okay, so we're gonna talk about associated conditions with hydroadenitis superativa. So as I said, my goals for today are for to build confidence in your knowledge about HS um, so that you can advocate for yourself and be a better informed patient when you see your doctors and when they're talking to you um, to build empowerment for you so that you feel good about your disease so that you have the knowledge. Um, if you're feeling any of these other conditions or have questions about them, you feel comfortable asking. Um, and additionally to provide support for you um, and anyone else uh, going through HS or having or any other um, person with HS. So I'll start. So the first couple um, conditions we're gonna talk about are just skin conditions. So hydroadenitis can occur on its own or it can have some associated skin conditions. One of them is acne. Um, so traditionally we think about acne on the face or the chest or the upper back, um, but it can be associated with HS because we think that both diseases involve um, the hair follicle as well as the oil gland and they're situated in a complex in the skin. And so we think that plugging or bacteria overgrowth with that plugging of the oil glands and the hair follicle can contribute to acne formation as well as those oils or uh, painful um, and uh, inflammatory bumps that you see with HS. The second condition is called dissecting cellulitis of the scalp. And so what this has been referred to, which I think is a bit easier um, to just think of is just having HS, but it affecting the scalp. So you can get painful nodules, um, swelling with hair associated hair loss on the scalp. Um, the other is something called pyoderma gangrenosum. And all I want you to remember is that you can have skin ulcerations on the lower, on the legs, the thighs, the arms, the forearms or hands that don't resolve on their own. And then also something called a pyelonidal cyst. Um, and this is an in inflammation on the lower back kind of by the upper cleft of the buttock. And I'm gonna show you pictures of all of these conditions so that they make more sense. Um, so acne, this is a female patient, but she's developing um, red bumps on her jawline and neck. Sometimes you can get smaller bumps that look almost like plugged pores. Um, and this is a male patient who, if you can see, he has some areas where the hair is not growing with some scar. And that is that dissecting folliculitis where he's getting those bumps just like HS, but on his scalp. And over time, that inflammation causes some of the hair loss you're seeing. Um, and then this picture is a picture of those ulcers on the skin that we call pyoderma gangrenosum, but I just want you to remember that these can be painful non-healing ulcers on the skin. Um, they can start as little pimple-like growths and then get bigger. 
um, and become more wounds. And so if you were to have any wounds that were not healing um, and were painful and sometimes maybe growing in size over time, that's something that you would want to see your doctor, specifically your dermatologist or your regular doctor, because the treatment um, if you're undergoing treatment for your hydroadenitis, we might alter this so that we can treat both your hydroadenitis and these skin ulcers as well. The next condition is something called a pilonidal cyst, or sometimes people call it a pilonidal sinus. In my practice, I've met many patients with HS and, and sometimes I'm the one that first diagnoses them with a pilonidal cyst. So you know, it can be something that you just associate with your HS. Um, it is a swelling or painful bump um, at the top of the, the buttocks or the lower back. Sometimes people notice this if they're sitting for a while, it can flare this up. Um, if they're, you know, it can be just like your HS where it's quiet for some period of time and then flare with sitting or just flare on its own because it can be larger in size, it can almost feel like it's coming from the side of the buttock and not the top of the buttocks. Um, and the reason this is important is because sometimes if it's bothersome over time, you know, it, sometimes we do do something in the office to help with this, but other times if it's large or very deep, we like to refer you to our friends in, in surgery and they can actually remove this for you because for some patients that can, this can be very um, limiting in terms of their activities, um, needing to sit for work with, the, with flaring. And so it's important that we know if this is occurring or if you notice that you're getting more of the flares in this area. Um, and the next condition that we see is arthritis with HS. So it's something called inflammatory arthritis. This is a little bit different than some of the arthritis you might've heard of like rheumatoid arthritis or osteoarthritis, um, which many of us get just with time. Osteoarthritis is just when the joint space wears down and we have bone on bone. So we call it arthritis of use. This is different. This is inflammatory arthritis. Um, and, and we think this happens because HS is a condition with generalized inflammation in the body. And we think that this could also occur in the joint spaces. So what would you see? You would have pain and swelling and joint stiffness. This might present on the lower back or with neck pain. It can be relieved with over-the-counter pain relievers. So just because that the pain reliever helps doesn't mean it couldn't be inflammatory arthritis, um, but it's persistent. So it's ongoing and chronic, meaning it can flare up with your HS or apart from your HS. Um, but just taking pain reliever for one day or a few days won't get rid of it. And it can occur, this arthritis can occur before or after you, you were, your HS started. So if you have any question about the joint pain or swelling in your hands or, or knees or elsewhere, this is something you'd wanna uh, direct your doctor's attention to. Um, again, because it's something we want to know about because your treatment for HS could change. We might, you know, think about using something like a Humira or a biologic therapy. And so, and the reason might be because it would treat both your HS and the arthritis that's, that's happening to you. Um, this second problem is something I'm personally interested in with our HS patients, anemia. Um, and so anemia is when the red blood cell count is lower than normal. And so the red blood cells carry oxygen to our tissue, tissues and elsewhere in the body. So anemia means that your red blood cell count is lower than we would expect for, and we divide that by your age and sex. Um, and so this can happen, some of my HS patients, just from the drainage that they have, there's some blood with their drainage. Um, and then sometimes you can have lower red blood cell counts when you have a more persistent medical condition like HS, like rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and so what are the signs of this that you might experience? You could have increased fatigue or tiredness with physical movement. So going up the stairs causes your heart to race. You feel just 
overall tired, no matter how much sleep you get at night, you still feel fatigued or tired. Um, sometimes people notice that you might look more pale compared to your normal, or they might notice the lower part of your eyelid rim um, looks paler. Um, you can also have restless legs or what some people have described are like the Charlie horse feeling that aching in your legs at night. Um, these are all some of those symptoms. When we first see you at UNC, we do, um, in our HS clinics, we do get regular blood work. So we would see if you had anemia and depending on whether or not you had anemia and, and the type, we might start iron pills over the counter, or sometimes iron infusion is needed. Um, and sometimes the anemia gets better as we treat um, your HS. But it is definitely something that we want to be on the lookout for because it can cause a lot of fatigue um, and limiting symptoms. So you, you know, you're not going to want to exercise and do other things if you're feeling tired all the time or weak. Um, so that's why it's important for us to know. Um, the next condition is called polycystic ovarian syndrome. And some people abbreviate it as PCOS. Um, this affects females. And so some things that you might wanna ask yourself or ask your doctor about, if you're still having menstru menstrual cycles, you have not gone through menopause yet, are your cycles regular or do they skip months at a time? Have you ever been told that you've had cysts in the ovaries? Have you had difficulty becoming pregnant? Um, and have you noticed any increased body hair on your chest, your stomach, or back? Um, and, the, and the reason this is important is because um, PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome can be treated with some medic, can be managed with some medication. And sometimes that can also help the HS flares and the frequency. And so we like to use those medicines for both. Um, and it just offers another treatment. We can use those medicines for our HS patients, but sometimes if they also have PCOS, then we like to know. Um, sometimes PCOS can also present as having some um, sugar control um, issues that we need to know about. So sometimes sugar control can be hard if you have PCOS. And so that's, we like to know that so we can help with that and also guide your primary care doctor if they haven't diagnosed you with that already to let them know to keep screening for the glucose or sugar in your blood to make sure that that is within normal. Um, and other medicines we might use are, um, will help with flares around your hormonal cycle for females, which can also help with PCOS as well. Um, so that's why it can be important for us and for you to know about. The next condition is, called, is abdominal weight. No one likes to talk about weight. I, I completely understand, um, but this is important because abdominal weight, so weight around our abdomens, which is very common as time goes on and where a lot of stress associated weight can form, is important because it can be sometimes um, associated with other things like diabetes or, um, cholesterol problems. So we like to know, or we like to screen you for those. So abdominal weight is something we want to keep close eyes on. And sometimes it can be as subtle for all of us as we're trying, you know, we're losing weight or we're fit, but just around the belly is the hardest area to lose. It's very stubborn. Um, and that's a common history for most of us maybe easier to lose weight, but then around that belly is sticking around. And I like to talk about it with patients. Has your doctor ever said you've had an, you have an elevated BMI? BMI is just a measure of your weight and height, basically. Um, it just tells you another way to look at your, uh, your weight. And so BMI, don't get, you know, lost in that jargon. We're just trying to, to make sure that your weight um, is within normal or help you get to that point. Why does that matter? Because sometimes weight, increased weight can cause, can be associated or can be a risk of having HS. And so 
heavier weight can sometimes cause more flares just from friction and from the skin rubbing against each other. And so sometimes losing weight or, or focusing on nutrition can help with that. Alternatively, sometimes increased weight can be associated with sugar being too elevated in our blood. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but the weight alone um, can be a sign of other um, maybe future um, challenges that we wanna know about and, and be on alert for. So that's why. So like I was just saying, um, insulin resistance, what does that even mean? So insulin resistance just means that our body, our pancreas releases insulin. Insulin is like the little, little delivery man brings the sugar into the body. If insulin, if your body is resistant to insulin, the sugar is not getting into your organs and where it needs to go. And it's just floating around and it can cause some damage um, and some destruction if it does that. And so we want all the insulin to be absorbed in our body and to carry the sugar into our body. Um, and so insulin resistance is just telling us that all the sugar, it might not be getting where it needs to go. And it's, it's just hanging around and causing trouble. It's loitering, so to speak, in our body, and we need it to go where it needs to go. Um, and so some other words for insulin resistance, so it can be not to get, you know, stuck down in the, the titles of things, but other words can be pre-diabetes or diabetes mellitus. Um, so I screen all my patients with HS for this, um, unless they have a known history of diabetes and just had this screened, because I like to know um, if they have pre-diabetes or diabetes. I've diagnosed several of my patients with diabetes and pre-diabetes. Um, it's a very common condition. And I think the goal with it is just to keep it in control. And then every day becomes, it's not something that's going to challenge you every day. It's something that we keep in control. And the reason we want to is because HS can flare if your sugar is elevated. The better the sugar is controlled, the better your HS can do. And so what are some things that you might have heard before from a doctor or just heard around? You might have been told that your sugar level is elevated or abnormal. I ask patients, any family members, mom, dad, siblings with pre-diabetes, diabetes, um, have you ever noticed darker patches of skin under your arm? So the armpit area, the back of the neck, the knuckles of the hands, that can be a sign of pre-diabetes or diabetes diabetes. So what can we do? We can make sure that our physician has a good check on the, our sugar average. So how do we check our sugar average? It's something called hemoglobin A1C. You don't have to remember that term, but we as doctors can check your sugar level for the past three months. Um, and that gives us an idea of how things are going. It's very easy to do. Um, but you want to make sure that your sugar levels are within normal. And if they're not, then we do something to help them. And that in, in turn can help the flares of HS and the severity of HS. The next um, topic are lipids. So lipids, what are they? Lipids are just cholesterol in general. Um, and so sometimes we can have elevated cholesterol when we have HS. So why is cholesterol bad? Cholesterol is bad because if you look at that picture, those round red particles are the blood in the artery. That cholesterol is kind of sticking to the sides of the artery. It's very sticky. You could think of it like that. And it's blocking the blood flow through that artery. We want all the blood flow to go through nice and easy, no limitations, no narrowing. Um, and so that cholesterol causes a problem by sticking around the artery and not having the blood flow. What happens when the blood doesn't flow? You can have chest pain. Um, you can have just the kidney doesn't like that. The kidney wants lots of blood flow. It gets angry when it, that happens and it can um, increase 
the creatinine or a measure of how well the kidney is working. So we don't want that. Kidney gets unhappy. We need all the blood to get to our organs so that we don't ever have any chest pain or heart problems. Um, so that is the role of the cholesterol. You might hear terms like cholesterol, triglycerides, they're all lipids. They're just, and you can refer to them all as cholesterol. Um, but what you want to kind of look for is, or th ask yourself, has your cholesterol or triglycerides, again, just lipids, been abnormal before? Most people have had some abnormal cholesterol at some point in their life. It is not uncommon. Um, has your doctor ever recommended that you take medicine for your cholesterol before? Do you know if a close family member, parent, brother, sister has a history of elevated cholesterol or triglycerides? Um, and that can be important because apart from HS, you can have genetic reasons for high cholesterol. That can be genetic. Mom had really high cholesterol. Now I have high cholesterol. What the important part is knowing if you have abnormal cholesterol and then fixing it with either medication or diet um, so that it doesn't stick to our blood vessels. So what can you do when you see your regular physician? Um, you can ask them, how are my, how's my cholesterol? Have you tested it? Can we test my cholesterol? I'd like to know kind of my baseline. Um, and that can be done at once a year. Um, sometimes if it's abnormal and they start a medication, they check it every three months for some time just to see how you're responding to the medication. But this can be important um, for us. So especially in the setting, if you have um, some altered sugar in the body um, and some just excess kind of fat around the abdomen, sometimes your lipids or cholesterol can also be elevated. Not always, but it's important. It's an important measure that we should all know about ourselves, whether we have HS or not, but particularly in HS because of those other conditions. Um, and so anxiety and depression. This is so important to address with someone that you trust. This is the ups and downs of any condition that is chronic has an effect on our, our self-image, our interpersonal relationships. Um, so I, we have a screening tool that we use at UNC that asks our patients about anxiety, depression, mood, how they're feeling. Um, depression, doesn't always present the way we classically think of with um, known feelings of sadness. Sometimes you can have increased or decreased sleep. You can lose interest in your normal activities that you previously enjoyed. You could feel worthless or hopeless. Patients with any chronic condition, but in particular HS, have higher levels or increased risk of anxiety, depression. Um, and so we screen patients for that because you, we have talking doctors that you can talk to about having a chronic disease. Uh, sometimes medication is needed to help with our moods. Um, and so that's why we bring this up because it is not something that you have to suffer with in isolation. Um, that's why we're here as doctors to help. And um, there are like this support group where you're all a part of, um, so we, so this above many of the things I'm gonna talk about today are equally as important um, to you. Um, and sometimes our depression or anxiety don't present the way we classically think of them. Sometimes it doesn't even hit our awareness that, oh, I am kind of apathetic or have no interest in my previous activities. And so you wanna just screen yourself for that. If family members or friends are telling you that you seem more isolated, you're not picking up their phone calls, you're not partaking in activities you previously liked, then that's something that you want to be on your awareness to talk to your doctor about or someone you trust. And if it's not your doctor, then someone you trust who can help you get in to see the doctor or a doctor. Um, And then lastly, um, tobacco use. So smoking may be where, you know, the data so far shows that smoking may be a risk factor for hydroadenitis. Um, so 
a common scenario is that I have a patient who smokes, um, and I, you know, I say, we don't know every, um, associated condition, but I can tell you about one of them and that we know of tobacco use. Now, if that patient were to quit smoking today, would his HS go away? No. Um, but it is possible that his flares and severity of flares and inflammation could decrease or improve. Um, and the reason is, is that smoking is inflammatory and attracts inflammatory um, parts of our body to an area. And so he could improve by cutting down. Overall, cutting down or quitting tobacco use can only help you and your general health. Um, and again, back to the previous slide, the stressors in life can be a reason um, to smoke or it's a stress relief. And so those are, again, just want to readdress that increased anxiety or depression with a chronic condition. Another way to go about that is to join support groups like you have, speak to a, a psychologist or a, a doctor that will talk about um, coping strategies, stress relief. We all need them. Um, and sometimes medication is needed to help us get through this. Um, and then the last one that I wanted to include is increased empathy. So studies have shown that being in a support group of your peers can increase your empathy um, and patients do better um, overall in terms of their condition with um, peer support. So you're in a unique position. You've gained an understanding about the challenges faced with this condition. Um, this offers you perspectives and understanding that many family members, spouses, children, and outsiders cannot fully grasp. Um, you can offer insight into the management, the flares, the wound care, the treatments, the general frustrations, the feelings of loneliness, and much more for someone feeling overwhelmed and just starting out on this path. So, you know, I think your experience is associated with can only be associated with help for others who are just starting out on this path. And I know a lot of you are advocates for your um, peers, but I think just having this experience can be used in such a great way for people that are just starting out or having a hard time with this disease. Um, so that's great. And I thank you for doing that. Um, and that's the end of my talk but I welcome any questions for me. Okay, so one came in, um, I'll read it. It is, yeah. are vascular calcifications a comorbidity with HS or other chronic inflammatory diseases? And if so, can we do anything to treat this condition once we already have them? Yes, um, yes. So the, the answer is yes. It is uh, comorbid just means that having one condition might increase the risk of having another condition. So because you have, let's say HS, you could be at risk for condition XYZ. So we see this with psoriasis, which is another skin condition. Um, it's thought to be inflammatory as well in the body. So not just on the skin, it affects the joints. Um, and like I was, we were, you were just asking cholesterol. Um, and so, once you have calcification in the arteries, which probably a majority of us have just as we age, right? Um, you wanna you want your doctor to start you on a cholesterol lowering medicine, and sometimes it can be more than one. And the goal is that you are not increasing the amount of sticky cholesterol around the arteries so that they don't narrow too much. Um, sometimes your doctors. If there's any concern, we'll have you do a stress test where um, you exercise or you're, they give you something to act like your body's exercising. You don't always exercise physically and they see how the heart looks in reaction and make sure that all the arteries are nice and clear and there's no chest pain or problems. Um, but that would be something your primary doctor would work you up for or a cardiologist. So the goal is to be told your cholesterol or lipids are abnormal and then to treat and to follow up with them every few months to see your response to treatment. 
And sometimes they, you know, they, they advocate, your doctor will advocate for um, putting you on or avoiding high cholesterol foods to help in addition. I'm not an expert, but um, that's genuinely what we learn. I'm sure they have a whole toolbox um, of medications and interventions, but um, just diagnosing you and getting you there is most important. Okay, another question. Do you recommend any special diet? Following Dr. Danby's work, I stopped eating dairy and yeast, and I think it might be helping, but it's only been a few months. Yeah. Um, in regards to HS in general, or? It doesn't say specifically, but my guess is yes. Okay. So um, if you think it's helping, I will never argue against that because I think that there are, I think diet in general, I will say is hard to, to measure. We've looked at diet and acne and it's hard. What we've found is that dairy probably is the most, um, most um, at risk of causing and um, acne flares, but ironically it's skim milk that they've isolated, um, which seems kind of counterintuitive because you think sometimes more healthy, but probably the processing might put it at risk for causing more acne flares. With HS and acne, it's really hard to measure how people eat and what they eat. So for acne, when they think about acne, they think about teenagers, asking teenagers to write diaries of their food intake is really unreliable and putting people on restricted diets can be kind of um, not always thought of as great way ethically to measure things. So um, I feel the least comfortable with diet and HS in that I think that people have talked about anti-inflammatory diets and avoiding nightshade and other foods. Um, and I think we just don't know. I think the data, it very well could be that dairy um, plays a large role in flares, but the data is, is lagging behind. And I feel when my patients tell me I've avoided this and it's helped, then I don't argue and I agree. That being said, I don't want anyone to feel like they have to drastically cut something out of their, um, their diet at this moment, um, because I would say the data is still, we're, we still don't have the data to support that. So going back to the um, diabetes screening, mm -hmm. uh, is there a recommended uh, frequency that someone should be screened yeah. for this? And does it increase if there's like strong family history or anything like that? I think annually is usually what we recommend if it's normal. If, so once a year is usually sufficient. If it was um, abnormal, then usually we screen every three or so months to see. And, and that can be, I should track back for a second. If it's abnormal and, it, and so if it's abnormal, if you're pre-diabetes, I often start metformin for my patients because metformin um, can control the sugar, but it can also help. It's uh, anti-hormonal androgen uh, medicine. So it can help with HS flares as well. So I use it for both. And if I have a patient who has PCOS, I might also use it um, because it's been shown to help with um, PCOS patients um, as well, not to get too complicated, but, um, so once a year, if it's, if your, um, average sugar is normal every few months and that in particular, it could be, um, in res because we're measuring your response to the medications we started for the sugar. So usually I think it's no sooner than three months because, um, that measure is, a, is just an average of the three. It's a snapshot of your past three months and how your sugar has been. Okay, I'm checking all the places and I don't see any more questions. Um, so I, I think that that might be it. So thank you for your um, time today. We really appreciate you taking time out, especially on a Sunday to have a chat with us about HS and other diseases. And I don't want anyone to feel overwhelmed by, I went through a lot of different conditions. You may never encounter one of these conditions at all. So, um, but it's just, I think knowledge is power, being a patient myself, having family members as patients, it can be, it can build confidence in ourselves when we talk to our doctors or our care team, just having some background knowledge. 
Um, and that's all I want to do is just give you confidence um, and the information that you might encounter um, as you see us or your primary doctor. Um, and so not to feel overwhelmed at all by this information. Oftentimes these screenings are done just as part of your regular annual check. But I think, you know, sometimes we need to know what we're at risk for in anything. And just knowing possibly the names or the general sense puts the power back in our court as patients. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So thank you and getting some uh, comments and some thanks from uh, participants. So, oh, yes. Yeah. So and I you can you. always contact me or Angela if you have specific questions or anything. I'm happy to give a talk. So thanks for, for listening to my voice. Hopefully my New Jersey accent was hidden, but it comes <laughs> out sometimes. <laughs> oh, we, we put our accents on full display. And yes. one question did come in. Um, it's just about the playback of the webinar. Yes, we're going to put it online. I made a little mistake and accidentally put it on my personal Facebook. I'll put the recording on uh, public um, Hope for HS site. So it'll be there um, for everyone um, to review and watch and send um, to whomever you want to. So okay. we'll do that. Yeah. Thanks, guys. I hope you all have a wonderful Sunday afternoon. Thanks for having me. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye.